Hi everyone. Uh, I hope you're all enjoying Build Peace. I'm sorry I can't be there with you. I love attending. So it's got great energy, but I'm glad I can participate and, uh, and add to the program this way. So my presentation is titled Digital Sojourners, uh, Technology in the Lives of Urban Refugees. And we're going to be talking about uh, two years of, of field work that we've done with uh, surveys and interviews of uh, refugees living in, in large urban centers. We picked the word sojourners for the title uh, because very often what we saw was uh, a phenomena that was less about migrating and staying or formally seeking protection from the UNHCR uh, as a refugee, but people seeking protection, but also seeking it in cities, in enclaves, in places where they were generally in a liminal space. They were in a liminal space from a legal perspective. Uh, Often protection came with finding community to fit into, and in many cases people moved around or knew they were going to move on. Um, so in this case we thought the word sojourner uh, captured the phenomena we were seeing, and we wanted to understand the role that access to digital tools played in facilitating that. Um, so where did we do our research? We started in, in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, doing research on IDPs, and we also interviewed Venezuelans who had come to Bogota as well about technology use. Uh, the second place we did work was in Nairobi, in Kenya, uh, interviewing and doing survey work with refugees who had come from outside Kenya and moved in to Nairobi from different countries around East and Southern Africa. And then the third place we've been doing work is Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, which very much like Nairobi, uh, is a city with multiple enclaves of different nationalities of people who have come here seeking uh, protection and, and safety uh, from around Southeast Asia. We picked these three cities because they're all big urban centers, they're all capitals, uh, they all have a long history of receiving uh, people seeking refuge and people seeking safety. Uh, they have enclaves very similar to one another in that people have a place to come to initially and they either stay there or may settle into different parts of the city. Um, so we saw a lot of similarities in the experience that these cities had with receiving people uh, seeking protection. Uh, but we also realized you know, these are very different regions and very different dynamics. So we had a chance to understand maybe some comparative dynamics about how technology fit into people's lives, but also to explore the idiosyncrasies of each city. What I'll talk about mostly here is uh, the comparative uh, data that we saw, the, the comparative experiences across all three. So what did technology mean to sojourners, uh, in this case, uh, in all three cities? Well, as a, a technical person working in development, uh, I tend to think of you know, health provision, education provision, uh, livelihoods and jobs, so very kind of SDG boxes. And we thought, do people also think of kind of these SDG boxes when they use technology? We found a few did. Uh, there were some people I would think of as kind of power users, people who were really tuned into the tech side of things, and they would use uh, apps to, under, to, to do uh, health research. They would use YouTube uh, to do kind of videos like Khan Academy or MOOC type videos. But these were very much the minority. Of, uh, of people we talked to. And we also asked, you know, safety. When people took the journey, did they have a mobile phone? Did it help being connected, being able to send a text or check social media to, to make your way along through the journey? And what maybe surprised me a little bit was how few people uh, use these tools. Uh, some people in Malaysia uh, from different communities talked about the importance of social media in making their decision. Um, these tended to be higher educated, uh, wealthier people who had moved, uh, for example, from Pakistan. When you talked with people who had fled under more acute circumstances, especially across the Thai border, uh, what you heard was, you know, if people had a mobile phone when they reached the Thai border, uh, when they switched over to being trafficked by traffickers and agents, the phone got taken away. So they were very much uh, in an isolated and high risk setting. Uh, without communication technology. In Kenya, what we found was people would say, yeah, we used face-to-face -face networks because we had to flee quickly, things got left behind, and we didn't reacquire a phone until we 
reached Nairobi or we reached the first place we took a break during the journey. Um, so in many ways, connectivity ceased once people were on the move and was reestablished once they'd settled. Across all three, by far the biggest thing we heard, especially for people in Kenya and uh, Kuala Lumpur, sorry, Nairobi and Kuala Lumpur, was the importance that uh, WhatsApp, Viber, Emo, these uh, voice and text over IP services played in staying in contact with family. These were actually some of the most emotional stories I heard about people using these tools to see family members who had been resettled, family members who are in different countries, as a mechanism for just maintaining some sense of, of family connection. Um, and as I thought about hearing these stories, it reminded me that in many ways, dealing with stress uh, and, and having the opportunity to see your child, to see your wife or husband uh, once a week on a video chat, itself was a means for Way supporting health outcomes. Just having a break from that constant stress, the constant worry, the constant not knowing of what's coming, um, you know, having the opportunity to step away from that uh, itself creates space for people to uh, achieve the kind of livelihood outcomes that we tend to think of in very technical terms in, in development practice. And while technology meant this, while it meant these connections, while it meant these benefits, uh, and we also saw that it was a constant reminder of being in the liminal space, being the outsider. In many cases, people didn't have the ID, the correct ID to get a SIM card, the correct ID to open a mobile banking account. So each step of getting access involved potentially breaking the law, being reminded that you're an outsider, having to rely on neighbors you might not know well, and really trusting that they're not going to steal your money, that they're not going to report you to the police when you ask them for help. So again, it was a reminder of being an outsider, and it was a reminder of the stress of, of having to navigate these systems when you're not part of the, the legal structure. In some cases, it also meant submitting to surveillance. It meant submitting to certain mechanisms of communication. If you wanted to register to use the digital record system that UNHCR set up in Kenya, you had to have a mobile phone. You had to be able to receive text messages and phone calls because that was the only way to set up your two-factor authentication to log into your own, to log into your own uh, records file. You know, this is it's kind of forced into an administrative jacket. You don't have a great deal of choice about this. Um, and, and I found in some ways technology was a blessing in that it connected people, uh, but it could be a real challenge in that it was a constant reminder in every activity under, underwent that uh, there was a certain otherness and a certain forced liminality about the lived experience. So what does this all mean? How do we support uh, technology access that empowers uh, as opposed to administratively constraining uh, urban refugees, sojourners. Uh, the first is to look beyond development themes to figure out how people can achieve livelihoods. So for me, it was realizing these connections of family, reestablishing contact with a loved one, uh, the impact that had on taking a break from the stress has health outcomes. It has the ability to step back, and take a breather, and be motivated again to keep trying to be resettled keep trying to find a job. Um, so in many ways, the direction by which we reach the livelihood outcomes is not the way that a development practitioner would think of in these networks of family and friends. Uh, and the ability to reach them and see them uh, are critically important. The next is affordability, affordability, affordability. Uh, people use WhatsApp because it's cheap. And as a development practitioner, when I think of an app, when I think of an information platform, I tend to think of like a gigabyte a week because that's cheap for me. Most of the people we talked with worked in megabytes in the 50 to 100 megabyte range per week because that's what they could afford. That's what WhatsApp covered, but a bigger, heavier app is going to take too much from people and they're not going to use it. And the last thing, start from thinking about internet access as a right. If we as NGO or uh, international organization workers think of this as a right instead of an economy, 
then we can start to marshal our resources in such a way to give people the most access and the most choice in how they use uh, their internet access, how they use their data, and it might very well be that it's, it's family, it's being in contact with loved ones that gives them the most energy and the most connectedness to continue uh, the journey they're on, as opposed to forcing them into a straitjacket, uh, a technological straitjacket. It just may not fit. So that's what we learned. I hope you enjoyed listening. Feel free to contact me on the platform or on Twitter, and enjoy the rest of the conference.